everyone! Welcome to episode number 581 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. Longtime friend of the show, Poolin Desai, joins me this week to chat about major trends in vision, radar, and LIDAR, AI inference trends that are driving the need for flexible and programmable digital signal processing, the role that pre- and post-processing plays in sensor-based applications, and why digital signal processing is becoming in indispensable in the new world of artificial intelligence. Also this week, I check out a new PCB prototype that is almost completely recyclable because it can turn into jelly. But first, please welcome Poolin to Fish Fry. Hi, Poolin. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. It's always great to talk to you. Excellent. It's always great to talk to you, too. Okay, so we're talking about DSPs today, but Poulin, how are AI inference trends driving the need for flexible and programmable DSPs? It's a great question. Yeah, so, you know, we've been in this whole AI uh, revolution for last 10 to 12 years, and, you know, everything kind of restarted with this whole thing with AlexNet. And we went into what I call the a CNN, Convolution Neural Network Architecture. And we went into shallow network to the deep network. And people also tried a lot of different type of architecture. And so what you saw was that there was a lot of activities happening in the AI related to computer vision in audio. Uh, those were all relying on convolution neural network type of architecture, LSTM architecture, RNN architecture. But still, it was moving very fast. A lot of changes were happening. Then what happened? There was attention is all you need paper came out, you know, and it was actually focused more on neural network focused on the audio side of it. But that changed the whole thing, you know, that created the base for a transformer network and generative AI. And that was a brand new architecture. And then same architecture that was created for the audio voice, LLM, whatever you call it, got converted in for the vision and the vision transformer came out. And then the vision transformer that is, you know, it continues to change. So what you find is that in the last 10 years, the architecture has been evolving, going from the conversion neural network, RNN, LSTM, to also to transformer vision network and transformer vision network being used for the LLMs to the vision side of it. And what we see is that that trend will continue. You know, there are lots of smart people working and continue to change the AI architecture. And because of that, uh, anybody who is designing an SOC that needs to survive for five years, it also takes a three years by the time an SOC gets done. You have to look at for a longer term solution. And that's where you need the flexibility. So it's a long answer. But the point of this whole thing is that AI continues to move very fast. And anybody who's designing an SOC for any market needs to look for the future and provide the flexibility for the future network they will get invented. That makes sense. So, Poulin, why are pre- and post-processing critical for sensor-based applications? So Cadence provide our digital signal processor for various applications in the automotive market, in the consumer market, or surveillance camera, AR, VR, and a lot of the data in those markets are coming from image sensor, radar, LIDAR, or, you know, you can think of a microphone as another sensor. And you would think that, okay, I can take this data and run some kind of an AI inference on it. But in most cases, you have to do some kind of a pre-processing to prepare the data so the AI engine that you happen to have on the data path can work on it. You know, And in that case, uh, you may have to do some resolution change. If the image data is coming from the image sensor, you may have to do some noise reduction on it. 
you may have to do some kind of classical digital signal processor before you can feed it to the AI engine. And then what happens is that, as we kind of touched upon earlier, that you may have built your AI hardware engine or the NPU, as people call it, that may not be able to support everything that uh, this AI needs it. And then you may have to do some post-processing or after you have done some AI, you may do some post-processing. So let's say you want to do some bokeh effect where you might do segmentation to segment out people in an image and then the background you want to blur. So that blurring effect may be the post-processing that you may have to do. So in a classical application that we are working with, the data coming from sensors that are those four sensors that I talked about, there's always going to be some kind of a pre-processing. There's some AI processing, and then there is a post-processing to then finally uh, make some decision on what was done with the AI. And what we tell our customers that when you are designing your SOC, you have to think an end-to-end solution and solve the whole data path. And that's what we provide to our customers. So, Poulin, what do you see are some of the major trends in vision, radar, and LIDAR? Yeah, so, you know, a couple of uh, major areas to look at it is that there is the big trend in sensor, right? So when we said sensors, we already talked earlier that could be image sensor, or sometimes people use the word camera, then the radar and the LIDAR. So now if you look at the image sensor, one of the biggest change that continues to happen and it's been happening, the resolution continues to increase. You know, you are going for the video. We were talking about HD. Now we're talking about 4K, 8K. If you are using this image sensors for any kind of automotive application or even AR, VR, or even you have a high frame rate that you are seeing. A similar way in the radar, you know, you are going from a simple 2D radar to what they call the 4D radar or the imaging radar. You know, you now are getting basically what we call here is a called 3D point cloud because you have a 3D or 4D imaging radar. In the image sensor, people might use a stereo camera. So those are specifically uh, related to the current technology. But then you're also new sensors uh, people use. A time of flight is something that people are using. People are using some new event-based sensors. So, so there are various of this sensor technology that's coming in to make uh, the performance better, right? Because high resolution, high refresh rate, and then you are getting into the 3D area. And then uh, the other trend that we see is that, uh, you know, whether it's automotive, whether it's a, a, your iRobot or robot, you're not depending on just one sensor, like an image sensor uh, that you had just image sensor on your mobile phone 10 years ago. Now you are having a radar or LIDAR or radar, LIDAR and image sensor or image sensor and radar. So you have a multiple of this different type of sensors and those are being used. So any solution that's out there in the market has to make sure that it can address all these various different sensors. That makes sense. Now, how does the new Tensilica Vision 130 and 110 DSPs address these trends and deliver better performance and energy efficiency? That's a great question. So what we are uh, providing is the digital signal processor for all this market that, that I talked about, the automotive market, the surveillance, the mobile cameras, AR, VR. And the biggest um, thing that we provide to our customers is the better energy efficiency and the better performance compared to the alternative to that running something on the GPU, CPU, and then flexibility for the future. And then, as we said, that we are also providing the option for them to bring a newer AI on it. So with the new product, uh, we are moving to our newer platform, which is what is called Extensa platform, which is our LX8 platform. And then what this LX8 platform, we are providing a system level performance improvement by behaving a better DMA. Customer can put L2 cash on it if they desire to do so. And the branch prediction for the seven stage pipeline that we are providing. So there is a tremendous platform level improvement that increases the performance. Then if we focus on the DSP, we are focused quite a bit on the floating point performance where we are improving the floating point performance, doubling the filling performance compared to our previous generation. 
and also doubling the FFT floating point performance. And both of those are quite needed when you are doing any radar type of applications or any kind of a processing and the 3D point cloud that I'd mentioned earlier. And then uh, our customer use our DSPs to do AI on it. So we have made improvement on our AI performance specifically for certain quantization and certain depth-wise convolution, those are used in a network like the mobile net type of network. So what we end up offering to our customers um, is a platform that improves the performance, a lot of system level improvements related to that, floating point performance, and then on top of it, AI performance improvement. All right, Poolin, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, I got a new one for you, Poolin. We're trying out a new question here. So if you could have one person to have dinner with tonight, doesn't matter if they're alive or dead, <laughs> who would it be? Oh, my God. There are so many people you, you <laughs> want to have. But I think, you know, people pay millions of dollars to sit down with Warren Buffett. But um, I was listening to Charlie Munger's uh, interview somewhere. So actually, instead of one person, I want to sit down with both of them. Huh. Uh, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett really learned the, the investment philosophies and all the wisdom that, that they gathered over the last hundred years. You know, So those two would be the people that I would probably sit down with. That's a great answer, Pullen. Well, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. All right. Thank you very much, Amelia. Did you hear about the new kind of printed circuit board that can turn into jelly? Okay, let's back up a sec. Most of the time, PCBs use a layer of non-conductive fiberglass substrate for electronic components. This fiberglass is made up of two ingredients, epoxy resin and woven glass fibers. Now, that substrate material is pretty difficult to reuse or recycle. In order to harvest the electronics from standard PCBs, sometimes that fiberglass has to be burned away. But this new PCB, developed by a team of scientists at the University of Washington, is something completely different. Instead of resin in that fiberglass substrate. This team used a polymer called vitrimer. When the circuit board is in use, the vitrimer stays rigid, strong, and non-conductive, just like its traditional fiberglass counterpart. But when this new kind of PCB, called vitrimer printed circuit board, or VPCB, is no longer of use, it can be recycled, and this is how it's done. First, it's immersed into an organic solvent, and then that solvent is boiled at a relatively low boiling point, and then the vitrimer swells and becomes gelatinous. After the substrate has turned to jelly, as you can imagine, the electronics and glass fibers can be taken off and used again because they aren't actually damaged in the process. On top of that, this team has also shown that 98% of the vitrimer can also be reused and up to 91% of the solvent too. So where can this process be done? Do we need special vitrimer manufacturing plants? Nope. They can be manufactured at existing facilities. And the best part, other than that dissolving into jelly aspect, which is admittedly fun to think about, scientists think that the use of recycled VPCBs could mean a 48% reduction in global warming potential and an 81% reduction in carcinogenic emissions compared to traditional PCBs. Assistant Professor Vikram Iyer, co-senior author of the associated paper on this research, says this about the potential impact of these VPCBs. He says, PCBs make up a pretty large fraction of the mass and volume of electronic waste. They are constructed to be fireproof and chemical proof, which is great in terms of making them very robust, but that also makes them basically impossible to recycle. 
Here, we created a new material formulation that has the electrical properties comparable to conventional PCBs, as well as a process to recycle them repeatedly. Super cool, right? So if you want to read more about this team's efforts with BPCBs, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. I've also included a couple links about today's interview with Poulin Desai from Cadence Design Systems as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of May 10th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>